Ooh ha too ha! Hi, my name is Bing and welcome back to Heroes of Animation. In this episode, we're looking at Aardman Animation, who were founded by just two guys, David Sproxton and Peter Lord, and are now an internationally famous brand responsible for a hugely diverse catalogue of films, television, music videos and ads. On top of the bigger titles, we're also going to be looking at some less recognisable projects that you might not even have associated with Aardman. Let's get started. I'm here in Bristol, home of this guy and Aardman Animation, who were founded in 1972 and have made an indelible mark on the UK and worldwide animation scene. I'm going to be talking to Merlin, who's the creative director for Wallace and Gromit, and he's going to be telling me everything there is to know about Aardman. That's if I can find the studio. I used to watch Aardman stuff when I was younger and I watch it now because it is so good. Wallace and Gromit is like, for me, that's like staple Christmas. Like every Christmas you gotta watch a Wallace and Gromit film. I mean, I remember I used to have an old VHS of Wallace and Gromit. It was the tape I had that I rewatched and rewatched and rewatched and sort of knew off by heart. I think for any kid who's grown up in Britain, you can't say you don't like Aardman. Yes. Merlin, hi. Bing. How's it going? All right, welcome. Ah, oh, this place is brilliant. It took me a while to find the place, Good. but now I'm here. Uh, could you show me around? Yeah, welcome to Ardman, um, our grand atrium. My name's Merlin, and uh, I'm the creative director for Wallace and Gromit here at Ardman. I got into animation completely by accident. I set out to become, you know, a photographer who would shoot for um, National Geographic. And one day I gate crashed an, an animation lecture that a friend of mine was going to. And that was it. Sold. I saved up, bought a Bolex camera, film camera, and taught myself to animate, got into film school, and ended up here. Ardman started in a shed, but we're not in a shed any longer. We're in this fantastic building. This is sort of the nuts and bolts of the company. So there's um, IT down there. This is the digital department. Features development over there. My desk and directors, kind of along this floor. Nick Clark, Pete Lord, Dave Sproxton, they've kind of got a penthouse suite of offices uh, on the top floor. The kings of the castle. Kings of the castle. When you're building a new building from scratch um, and you're a media company, why wouldn't you want a cinema? So we've got a lovely cinema. It's really nice. I want one. We've got a lift with um, the voice of Peter Salas doing, uh, mind your paws, lad, as, as the doors close. Doors closing, mind them paws, lad. That's amazing. I'm in a Wallace lift. There's uh, some crazy stairs which are apparently they're held in with Harley Davidson engine bolts. It's a pretty open and uh, dynamic building to work in. So Ardman is an animation studio. We are famous for stop motion animation, but we do much, much more. We make commercials, series, feature films, in computer, hand drawn, um, uh, for the internet only, and of course, stop motion with our very famous characters like Wallace and Gromit. The name Ardman comes from the very first character that Peter Lord and David Sproxton, who were the founders of Ardman, named a character. So, because they were based in the West Country and he was very tough, in fact, he was hard. He was Ard. He was the Ard Man. And so they were paid £15 by the BBC for this piece of animation, which went into a programme for deaf children called Vision On. And they had this check and needed a bank account, and so they created the Ardman Animations bank account. and. The rest is history. Tell me about these people. Yeah, this is sort of a rogues gallery of the founders and the, the, the sort of the early people at Ardman. So Peter Lord and David Sproxton, um, I wouldn't like to say when, but probably late 70s, early 80s. Pete and Dave essentially made films on their own to begin with, um, with commissions from the BBC. That was in the 70s. In the 80s, they started making television commercials, and that's when things really started to change. Some of the commissions that came through were really serious short filmmaking. One of those was Creature Comforts, and it was when Nick won his first Academy Award for Creature Comforts that Ardman's name as a studio skyrocketed. You know, there was, a, there was an awareness, but that really sent them into the stratosphere. Then Wallace and Gromit, obviously hugely successful, and, um, and, and sort of the snowball got bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Creature Comforts started from a commission from Channel 4, um, a series of films called Lip Sync. And Creature Comforts was Nick Park's contribution, um, featuring real people being interviewed about where they live. And um, Nick subverted that into characters, animal characters in a zoo. And the result is the Oscar winning Creature Comforts. I watched Creature Comforts when it came on TV and I love the concept of it. And I wish there were more animations like that. Taking these conversations and, and applying those emotions so like well to animals uh, and making their faces uh, just so brilliantly express uh, the things that are being said. I've stuff. always felt uncomfortable <laughs> with hot weather. I don't like hot weather. I don't like it. So, hidden in the post room, um, this is, uh, I think it's a, a copy of the original, the limited print of Nick's first concept drawing of Wallace and Gromit. Wallace and Gromit, um, created by Nick Park as his graduation film from the National School of Film and Television, which he never got to finish there, brought it to Ardman to finish making it alongside Creature Comforts and was actually Oscar nominated with Creature Comforts and he lost to his own film that year. Well done, lad. That's so different. He's got like Nasher style yeah. Yeah. mouth. Well, and, and Gromit was going to be a cat to begin with as well. So really? Yeah, yeah I think things have really changed. Wallace and Gromit are our famous duo. Um, Wallace is um, essentially quite a lazy man who invents crazy inventions to make his life a little bit more easy and Gromit is his long-suffering pal, dog, uh, companion who um, uh, essentially gets him out of every sticky mess that he gets himself into. Our big successes, if you like, have been our feature films. Chicken Run, The Great Escape with Chickens, really. It's uh, our first feature film. I think to this day it's still the highest grossing stop motion film of all time. Chicken Run is a great movie and if it was made as a cartoon I wouldn't enjoy it as much for some reason. I like the idea that you literally have these fat little birds that look like fat little birds. It's like when you're playing a toy instead of drawing something. These are from the Wallace and Gromit movie, aren't they? Yeah, so these are from Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Um, we've got quite a lot of little sets around and about. Curse of the Were-Rabbit, I remember as a teen at the time, sort of going to see it from pure nostalgia, and then turned out to be actually a really great film. This is kind of a classic, what we do. You know, in Where Rabbit, there was a whole department of people who just made miniature vegetables. <laughs> that, that was what they existed for. It's, it's definitely stuck with me, Wallace and Gromit. I don't know what it, what it is about, it's hard to sort of explain what exactly works about it, but it does somehow. Actually, I watched it the other day, and having worked on it for years and not watched it again for, for quite a long time, it's a good film, and, and that's what's important, a good film at the core of it. Flushed Away, our first um, computer-generated feature film. It's the story of a very upper-class rat who gets flushed down the toilet and has to make his way in the sewer um, with uh, the sort of the more real rats, and it's about his journey home. It was a great, big learning curve for us as a studio, but. Um, Again, really great fun with some great characters and some brilliant animation. But then we came back to where we really kind of feel comfortable, which is stop motion and um, pirates in an adventure with scientists, which is our swashbuckling pirating adventure across the high seas. It's just fantastically surreal and, and funny. It's a set from Pirates, from the Pirate of the Year Awards. Brilliant. And you've got like the canvas background and all that parallax stuff <coughs> still in there as well. Yeah, this was as it was shot in the film. Um, Except the flat uh, stages. The wasn't well, yeah, before. little penguin, little uh, cameo appears. As well as our famous characters, Ardman does a lot of things that you, you may not be aware that we do. Um, and commercials are probably the primary one. Enti, hi. How's it going? I'm oh, fine. How are you? All right? My name's Chris Entwistle, uh, everyone calls me Enti around here. Uh, I'm the head of the model making department and it's my job to design and build all the puppets for uh, short broadcasts and commercials. Commercials are an interesting thing because 
they're very short and they need to have impact and it's quite often an opportunity to try something new and to experiment. We did a couple of world record um, animations. The world's smallest stop motion animation called Dot. I think she was nine millimetres tall and it really was pushing the limits of our model makers to, to get that to work. And so having done the world's smallest stop motion animation, they thought it would be a good idea to um, create the world's largest stop motion animation. And the only place we could get to animate large enough was a beach. And it was decided to animate the sand, uh, a boat, and pixelate a real person. It was crazy and bonkers, but uh, it was achieved. And another, as far as we know, world Guinness World Record largest stop motion animation. So advertising can be really exciting like that. One of our directors, Darren Dubicki, made a great teaser trailer for um, the Pink Floyd play uh, written by Tom Stoppard. It really gets under the skin of the Pink Floyd and the imagery, uh, not traditionally what you would associate with Aardman, but striking nonetheless. This table's full of puppets from former commercials we've done in the past. Uh, we've just recently been working on Change for Life, the government-sponsored uh, oh, yeah, Keep I Fit routine. Guys. Because commercials are so diverse, we end up working with extraordinary you know, range of uh, products. So, famous ones, Duracell Bunny, Polo Mints, Hubba Bubba, Crunchy, one of my all-time favorites, Weetabix, Cooper Old Man from the old days. Who's this amazing guy? This guy is a Cooper Old Man for a Cooper Old Wood Preservative. He got a bit of a checkered past, really, because he, he, once he was kidnapped from the studio that I used to work in. Some people broke in through the roof obviously looking for tools and stuff like that in the workshop and they came across a Cuban old man and I uh, took him and held him for a ransom. A bit of an unfortunate end because Cuban old asked them where to send the ransom money. The burglar told them where to send the money and so Cuban old then sent the police round to the address <laughs> and uh, they got arrested. Brilliant. And that's a true story. We keep this table so that we show people like yourselves the different types of models. Yeah. We use because sometimes the puppets are just pure plasticine like morph. This was for a little uh, animation festival, the beginning of an animation festival. So we made a little Banksy morph. And morph was, doesn't have an armature to something like Wallace and Gromit, who has an armature inside him, but he's also made from resin and plasticine and foam latex. So there's a combination of the Wow. Do you think you could show me how to make maybe a simpler one, like morph? Yeah, yeah. So I think I could. Awesome, let's do that. Let's go to the bench. Well, Morph, basically, everyone thinks he's simple, but he isn't that simple, to be honest, but I'll take you to it. Would you like to do this at the same time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. That'd be brilliant. All right, so we just take three strips of plasticine and mm -hmm. just squeeze in into a bowl. And what you've got to do with Morph is you can't just pick a lump of plasticine off for an arm and then stick it onto the body. Yeah. He has to be built from one solid lump, because mm -hmm. if the arm and arms and legs are stuck on, then uh, when you're animating, there'll be a weak point at the shoulder yeah, and the hips. And then they're going to fall off. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so basically, once you've got your ball, start to pinch out the main form. So start to pinch out the head, and then start pinching out the arms. Really basic shapes at the moment. Pull the body down. You can always keep moving it around. The arms are always thinner than the legs, remember that. Because mm -hmm. if his legs are nice and thick and fat, it helps to hold the puppet up. And then basically, you just keep refining now. I was at college when I first discovered this industry, basically. It discovered me. Um, a chap came in, had a look around my degree show, and just asked me to do some work for him for a couple of weeks. That couple of weeks was nearly 30 years ago now, and it's uh, just carried on. So basically, I, I fell into it. <laughs> it's tougher than you think, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when you get into this stage, then you can either lick your thumb, or sometimes we use baby wipes, and this helps you to smooth the plasticine down without dragging all the plasticine around. Ah, I see. You know what I mean? While you're smoothing down, it's also important not to get too smooth as well because we do, we do want all the thumbprints in there. You know, yeah. it, it, adds, it makes it feel like it was made by real yeah, yeah. hands. It's yeah. a real solid thing. It yeah. reminds you how it's being made. That's right. There's a vibrancy to it all. You know, it's alive. We have a kind of house style which is becoming recognisable, uh, not only in the characters but also in the sets and the locations. And it's, it comes very much from things being handmade. When you miniaturise things, they tend to be a bit chunky and they aren't always 
perfectly made and it's those inaccuracies and the, the mistakes that we love. You know, we love to see the thumbprints and we love to see um, the marks where, where people have actually hand sculpted things and they are immensely detailed and we know that uh, our fans love the attention to detail. For the mouth, mm -hmm. what we do is traditionally you're supposed to do it with a, with a cocktail stick. Oh, I can do that bit, that's yeah. the easy bit. Oh, there you go. I'm just going to stop you there, Pete. <laughs> I like how I speak the wrong way. <laughs> 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 oh no, oh no, it's feet the wrong way. I've... <laughs> Easy mistake to make. <laughs> I've put his nose in his mouth on the, on the back of his head. <laughs> no, I'm not cut out for this. No, I think I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> you do not. Well, give him some eyes anyway. You yeah. Go. You've got to keep trying to improve yourself all the time, so just keep sculpting, keep drawing, and keep looking for good reference because it is very important. You can't scope something from nothing. You need reference points right at the very beginning. So spend a lot of time looking for good reference. Stand. No. <laughs> well, apart I, from the feet, it's not a bad effort. How many uh, hundreds of morphs would you say oh, you've made? Yeah, hundreds, hundreds. Because during a production, when when you're animating them, it, it tends to get wrecked pretty easily if, you, if you're squashing them. Oh, yeah. You know, so. You, you tend to make yourself you know, one, two, three morphs. In a CG film, you just kind of press copy and paste. You can have as many characters as you want, but in a stop motion film, you actually have to physically build them. The modeling clay does get mashed up and dirty and they need refreshing and rebuilding. So in uh, Wallace and Gromit films, for example, we would have probably over 20 Wallaces. Thank you for showing me that. That's been amazing. I'm going to let you get back to your work. That's no problem. No worries. We have to enjoy making these films because they take, well, a feature film takes five years from, you know, you have the idea, you write it for two or three years and, and then it's about two years to actually film it before it can be uh, put out on the cinemas. Taking a film from an idea through to the finished thing is a massive process. So what we do is we have the idea and we start writing and we write it and we write it and we write it again and we look at it and we probably write it again and another couple of times after that until the script is is as good as it can be and it does evolve after that so the script is then storyboarded and we will record um, that into an edit suite and we will um, read the script in I might do some and you know uh, anybody else might do some just to get an idea and we build the film rather loosely just to start getting a feel for it. And that's the first time that we will see the film. The storyboard is also running in parallel with the design process. And um, the production designer will work with the director on drawings, essentially, to begin with conceptual art, which then um, get taken into the art department, drawn up as technical drawings, and sets will be made out of everything. There's, there are no rules to making sets, wood, metal, plastic. Um, and then they look pretty good, but we're then when we give it to the set dressing team, which is a whole other team of artists, which actually elevates it from looking like a good model to a place that when you actually look at it, you can believe yourself being there. So this is a working prop. You can see it's still on its um, base. With this kind of thing, everything is perfect, even yeah. down to some of the tiles being oh, broken. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's, that, it's that, those inaccuracies. And the, the, I was noticing earlier, the rust. Yeah, absolutely. The little rust All those colours. things, the weathering, making oh. it feel like it. It's been used and it's aged, it's, got, it's been there for a while. It kind of all adds up to you making a world which it kind of feels like it's, it's been there before you visit Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And in that world, we have our characters. Through clay sculpting, you will work the design and, and, and let it evolve. And some characters start short and fat and end up tall and skinny. And the puppets are then taken into the model shop and they sort of have to be deconstructed because inside of them there's a ball and socket armature. Again, some characters are paint, have a final paint, some are um, fabric, some are silicone, but our most famous characters have clay hands and clay faces. And then the crew is all brought together and using that animatic as the template, we then go into production. And when you go into production on the studio floor, the animatic is the springboard and then we, we will animate the film for weeks, months, years, um, and then it goes into post-production. So we use 
cutting edge modern day post-production um, for compositing, um, for picture grade, for sound mixing. Um, essentially stop motion is one massive special visual effect as far as post-production is concerned. And then we get it out to the cinemas for everyone to enjoy. I'm just in awe at not just the story and the character, but the amount of work that goes behind bringing these things to life, bringing what's just plasticine to life. You can be amazed at how much effort must go into it of what you can perceive, but then if you just look into it even more, you'll realise that actually it's, you have no idea. The future, um, the future's good. Uh, we've got Sean the Sheep romping into another series, and after that, uh, a Sean the Sheep feature film, something that we're really, really excited about. Uh, apart from that, uh, Ardman's digital is sort of internet presence, making games and websites, and that's a whole new world of um, excitement for us. My name is Gavin Strange, and I'm senior designer here at Auburn Animations. In the digital department, we make games, apps, anything digital really. We sort of take all the characters that Ardman's known for and give them a digital home, whether that's our own stuff or working with third party clients as well. We're sort of like a design studio within the might of Ardman. We have currently a big project called Gromit Unleashed. Gromit Unleashed was this epic, epic project. And essentially what it was, was placing 80 five foot tall blank grommet dogs around the city of Bristol, all customised by a whole host of different artists. Amazing in itself. There are just some mind-blowing creations out there. It's, it's just fantastic. I got to be involved as an artist as well and it's been really nice working um, with the Grand Appeal to do that. And For my grommet I decided to try and work to my strengths because I'm not the best artist, I'm not a model maker, I'm not an animator, I don't have the hand-drawn skills but I am a graphic designer and an illustrator so I try to sort of work to my strengths there. So it's full of statistics and facts and um, bits of info about Wallace, about Gromit, about Nick, about Arben. So it was really sort of like um, my love letter to Arben really and, and giving people something to enjoy and to, to learn how we do things. I think Arben's unique because we do what we do. We, we don't really follow anybody. We, we're uniquely English. It's not that we sort of set out to do that, it's just what we do. There are lots of animation companies out there, lots of very good animation companies, but Aardman have always concentrated on the quality of the puppets that they want to get out and the quality of the, of the final product. The fact that you can see the thumbprints on the stop motion, it's made with love, it's, it's got those imperfections, it's those imperfections that add more to it. So I think it's just, it feels very warm and very nice and cuddly. Aardman's nice and cuddly, I think that's what people like about it. That's what I like about it anyway. It's great fun working at Ardman. If I'm honest, it's like a dream come true. We get to work on some of the world's best um, stop motion and animation in general. You walk in in the mornings and just on your way in through the building into my model making department, you pass so many creative departments. There are a good bunch of people here, everyone wants to be creative and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. The best thing about my job is being excited every day to make something, genuinely. I know that sounds really, really corny, but it's, it's true. I get to make fun stuff for people to enjoy. Best job in the world. I never intended to work here. I sort of ended up here a bit by accident, but a very happy accident. I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, this has been fantastically eye-opening. Thank you for having me. Thank you for showing me. You're around. very welcome. Ah, oh, it's been brilliant. I'm going to let you get back to your work. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to get back to my work. Good. But thank you for thank Good you again. Me. Well, this has been an amazing day at Ardman. I've learned a lot. I've got my morph. I'm going to head home, and I hope this episode gave you a fantastic insight into all the things, big and small, that Ardman Animation do. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed to Hoo-Ha for the next one. Click here for the episode we did on Lee Hardcastle and click here for the episode we did on Manga. My name's Bing and I will see you next time. <laughs>